We got our guy Isaac Feldman here who used to work with us. He yeah. works at the Sports Network. He fought last week and won. Winner by knockout from Long Island, New York, Isaac yeah. Feldman. Woo! Here's the problem with that. Now with the proliferation of MMA. Yes. You ain't got anybody. You have no idea. Because that dude, Isaac, who's a great kid, yeah. you'd look at him and go, I'll probably have this guy. I can handle this guy. He'd kill Meanwhile, you in 30 what? seconds. What? Right. Hey! And they're like, oh, damn, I hurt the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs>
maybe not rent out that office space or maybe a reduction uh, in workforce, let's say, uh, in certain businesses, uh, essential and non-essential. So uh, I do think that, uh, that we now are going to be in a new world. I mean, we were headed towards that way anyway in terms of uh, the, the new wave and new edge of technology, but uh, this will just certainly accelerate it one way or the other. Agreed, man. And uh, to kind of shift gears, but connect uh, Bloomberg to WFN and to me, uh, you know, the New York Post wrote WFN up as the the frat house type of media, like maybe like Barstool's big brother in terms of uh, chaos and story and gossips. Uh, how can you compare WFN's, uh, what would you say, uh, resume or history or stereotype surrounding it to that of somewhere like Bloomberg? Uh, if you, I don't know how much you know WWF wrestling stables, but for those listeners out there, let's just say Bloomberg is the right to censor, which is a bunch of guys in white shirts <laughs> with ties that would come down to the ring and basically Hold on, I gotta Google that. You know, the right that's fine. Censor and they would WWF. come down to the ring and no, you know, no scandal. <laughs> Dude, they look like Chippendales people. Oh, the Dudley yeah. boys were a part of it. Uh, now, now you're trailing off into the sunset like Butch Cassidy, and I'm not the Sundance kid. So what would WFN be? They'd be D-Generation X. I mean, that's an <laughs> Oh, my gosh. So, Rest in peace to Xbox. Those, yeah, if you want to make those comparisons, the, those two are pretty apt, I think. Did Xbox pa pass away? Am I, am I screwing up? No, Sean Wallman is still with us. Oh, he's, wow. I confused him and on. Eddie Guerrero. My bad. Eddie, Eddie Guerrero is gone. So. Rest in yeah. peace. So, um, moving on, brother. What do you think about the UFC coming back this weekend? I, I think the WWE actually had a big say in that because they've been running their sports out of their facility in Florida. And I think Dana White piggybacked off that and got the head of Disney, Bob Iger, on his side and convinced Bob and sold Bob on the reason why UFC needs to return, obviously with taking all the precautions and tests and whatnot before the fight. But, dude, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on this fight. They really dropped the ball by not making it free. But what are your thoughts about the UFC coming back this weekend? I understand that they have to make money. Uh, I thought it should have been on free TV, considering yeah. it was the first, uh, Steal first the event back. And then – you put the pay-per-view next Saturday, but I understand why they put the pay-per-view on this Saturday. First of all, it's a, it's a totally stacked card head to toe. Of yeah. the three cards, this is, this is the A card. So in that aspect, of course it makes sense to put that on pay-per-view. Could they have put all three on TV or all three on the ESPN Plus? Yes, but I think they, they tried to, uh, for lack of a better term, like split the baby. I think they wanted huh. to kind of appease some uh, some fans that are just casual and, and the diehard fans too uh, will buy the pay-per-view uh, on Saturday, which again is stacked head to toe, starting with Bryce Mitchell against Charles Rosa and going all the way to the main event, uh, Ferguson against Gage. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I agree with what you're saying. I haven't heard that take before that it's sh at the bare minimum, it could have just been on the ESPN plus subscription and you just, you flood people to have to sign up to see the main card. They could have done something like that. They could have, but I think that the UFC fan base is so saturated enough with people that have ESPN Plus already that they weren't going to get those um, those uh, those buys, those uh, those singular buys uh, that they would from a pay per view. Because if you're out there with ESPN Plus, I mean, I, they must have done the numbers with subscribers and figured out, okay, if we just give everything away on the, on the, how many subscribers are we going to get for $5 a month over a year, which is $60 a year compared to $65 in one shot on one Saturday night. I mean, it, it, the finances of course make sense for the UFC and for ESPN to do this. But from a fan standpoint, it kind of stinks that a lot of people out there that have had financial troubles, uh, certainly from coast to coast, uh, won't be able to afford to get the event. 100%. Again, we're being joined by the great Robbie Rosenhaus. Where in the world is Robbie? He's in his fucking car. Um, <laughs> oh. 
is this is this hard for you being the the traveling guy to just kind of like i know you get out of the house to get to work in the in manhattan um but is is this kind of like uh is do you have anxiety of sticking around the house more or are you keeping yourself busy no i think um i think i've found myself uh with 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 plenty to do i mean i've read some books i uh i've certainly watched a bunch of stuff on netflix i mean everybody nice. and their mother and their father has watched tiger king <laughs> i mean ozark, ozark was amazing uh, start to finish that was great uh so i watched that in like a week five seasons and uh, excuse me three seasons of that so uh yeah i've been keeping myself busy and hopefully uh other than the, the ufc returning this uh this weekend hopefully we'll start to see baseball and and, and basketball and some of the other sports uh follow suit and I think everybody will really appreciate when the other sports, not just MMA or not just WWE returns. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, baseball, man, is just going to be a breath of fresh air. You've been kind of broadcasting that through social media that you cannot wait for this freaking start of the season, man. Um, do, you, do you feel the mojo with the Mets? Or are you just, just excited to get sports going? Do you feel something special brewing with the Mets? I mean, dude, we have a freaking huge cloud hanging over us. Uh, with this Carlos Beltran. I, I literally brought out a Beltran jersey from 15 years ago. I was wearing it around during Christmas. All of a sudden, the news comes out about the whole cheating scandal. I don't think he should have been released. I mean, it was the players, uh, I guess. But uh, what's your whole thoughts on uh, Carlos Beltran? And what's your whole thoughts on the Mets and the baseball season? Uh, I think what they had to do was – get rid of him and, and any connections to what was going on there, uh, that they could be the, the only team that didn't. You saw what the Red Sox did. You saw what the Astros did. So uh, I, I think in that aspect, it was the right move. As far as being optimistic, uh, in a division where, you know, there are every team in the division, including the Braves who won the division last year, uh, have serious question marks. Uh, I think the Mets' chance is as good as anybody uh, to win it, especially with as good a lineup outside the Dodgers as there is in the National League. Is Cespedes uh, coming back? Is he going to be 100%? One, well, he's a big he's a big key to it. I mean, he says he is, and and every he's saying the right things. The Mets are saying the right things, but we'll we'll, we'll see. Maybe this shortened season that they're apparently about to have will help him in terms of uh, you know not playing as many games. Uh, and he's he's got these extra few months here to uh, to get better. So he's a key to the Mets lineup. Uh, so is Alonzo, and um, and so are the two corner alpha, and, and and so are the two corner outfielders. So and, and guys like JD Davis. So they're they're going to have to hit. Uh, I, the, the pitching is there. The bullpen was remade. So uh, I think they have as good a chance as anybody in the in the East to win. And uh, that's why I'm excited to uh, to get started. Now I pick by instincts. I'll just maybe I'll hear a number and I go over under. Uh, do you know what the Mets over under is for this year? I don't. It's probably eighty seven or something I mean, like that. Obviously it's adjusted now that now that it's uh May, but say we're on April first and the season kicks off, over under eighty five wins for the Mets. Uh well if we kicked off on on time, I would have said over. I mean I thought that wow. they were a ninety win team. Wow. I thought that they that they even without Syndergaard I thought they had enough pitching depth that they went out and signed guys like Michael Walker and Rick Porcello, veterans who can come in here and give them a year. And wait, give wait, them wait. The Mets, the Mets got Walker? You're as bad as Francesa cut people <laughs> off. Yeah, they, 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 uh, they brought uh, Michael Walker in from the Cardinals for one year. Oh, my gosh. And uh, Batances, right? Yes, and Dylan, but yes, reliever, but yes, Dylan Batances. Dylan Batances from the Yankees, yes. Give me a break, man. The show's called the Iktagon, not the uh, Ike the Field. That's fair. Fair enough. <laughs> and you next. Uh, let's go to Mike and Montclair. <laughs> <laughs> Around the world with Len Berman. There you, you go. You know what? Uh, you know what popped into my head about four days ago. Now, I love, Mark, I love Mark Chernoff. Uh, you know, he's a legend in the sports broadcasting world since the late 80s, taking over WFN and piecing together many great talent, including Boomer Carton and Mike and Chris Russo, a.k.a. Mad Dog. But, dude, Mark's time might be dwindling down. And uh, 
nobody's gonna push him out. He gets to go when he goes out. He's like the uh, the Joe Namath of sports radio. But what if Mike, when he finally gives up the reins of hosting, could you see Mike as a good executive or manager at Entercom Communications, uh, which, which which is the company that owns WFN? I don't think he wants to get involved in the day-to-day operations oh. of running of running a. Uh, it seemed like the Joe Torrey man, like the MVP candidate player. I obviously. think, I think he's done. I think with all the with all the talk that he's had the last couple of years about everything moving towards a digital phase and and radio kind of being phased out. I think uh, I think that's a long shot at best. Would you trust Mike's decision making? If he yeah, of course. To go for it. Yeah, I, well, yeah, he knows radio better than anybody, but uh, and, and so does Mark Turnoff. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think that that's going to be an option at this stage of his life, especially with three young kids. Okay, because I think that's where I must drop the ball. I must transition to the Fox Business Network, and he's still good. But I think he should have done something like oversee the new transition uh, of radio and podcasting. And I think Mike has an opportunity to be, uh, to do something special, bigger than his hosting career. He was still good, I miss. You know, he passed away recently. Oh, yeah. Know. So I screwed up X Pac and then I kept I miss a lot. <laughs> you are, you're, you're two for two. You know how they always say the things come in threes? If, if X Pac, if, if, um, if X Pac is out there listening, I mean, you know, this is gonna be bad news. <laughs> oh, all right. So then, my final thing: Have you been watching The Last Dance? Yes, I have. What are your thoughts on it? Real quick, real quick. I'm gonna get to my juicy question. Uh, I think it's, I think it's really well done. I'm really enjoying. For somebody that that was a, a little kid growing up in that era. The, I didn't really get an appreciation for that music and hearing that it brings me back to when I was in second and third grade and listening to that stuff. And, um, aside from that, I mean, on and off the court, you see, you know, what an intriguing and, uh, um, interesting character Jordan was, uh, from, you know, his card games on the plane to his intensity on the court uh, to his intensity in practice. Uh, I mean, I, I think my favorite part so far was when he took over the uh, scrimmage over in Spain when they were the, the uh, going for the gold medal in the Dream Team. And he didn't like the way that they were playing in practice. So he's like, okay, I'll, I'll show you magic. And yep, took yep, over. magic, magic. Um, so I just like how it's all put together. I think they, they got, a, they got uh, a ton of great interviews um, there's even some controversial stuff, like the Isaiah stuff, where M- MJ doesn't get along with him oh this week. Oh, my gosh. Has ESPN too. been milking Isaiah Thomas? Yeah, well, they, uh, Isaiah milked the Knicks for, you know, <laughs> Dude, he milked us dry. <laughs> that son of a for bitch. As good a, for as good a player that Isaiah was, that's how bad an executive he was. I mean, Eddie Curry giving him, you know, $60 million with Jerome James. I mean, get lost. I forgot anyway, about the Eddie Curry. Uh, yeah, Eddie Curry. Anyway. And the um, interns. <laughs> yes, well, I don't know about the interns, but Anuka Brown Sanders, I mean, that was a, that was a huge deal. They had to pay her a lot. The garden had to pay her a lot of money because of the sexual harassment thing. But anyway, that's, that's – All right, all right. That oh, my final thing. Let me get to my final question then. So No, but I'm enjoying the last dance to, to, to sum it up in an ambiguous way. Go ahead. My, uh, my thoughts on it, I just – Pippin contract and Rodman's character. Like that's what I've really, really gotten out of it. I think we all know the, the aura and the greatness of Jordan and it it nails it home uh, hearing him talk about all these situations and how competitive he is. But dude, learning about Rodman and Pippin, that was a pretty eye opening. Well, you're going to get a real good taste this week when you watch episodes seven and eight about how in 94, the Knicks and the Bulls met, uh, in the playoffs and Scott, that was Jordan's re- first retirement and the Knicks beat the bulls in the playoffs, but the bulls just led by Scotty Pippen 
were incredible, and they, they got hosed on a, on a call late in the game. There was a foul call by Hugh Hollins. You'll see it this week. It was a bad call, and the, and the Knicks ended up winning and going on to win the series. And um, The Scotty stuff is fascinating. If he would have been on any other team, he would have been, you know, he would have been a deity. He would have been a god. You know, in any, he would have had statues built to him. But just because he played in Chicago and, and because Jerry Krause was such a genius to get him there, um, you know, he's forever known as the second fiddle. Now, I'm not going to make the mistake and go three for three, like mentioned Jerry Krause. I'm uh, like saying I'm, uh, I'm efforting to get him on the Octagon. Obviously, oh we know what happened. Rest his soul. Uh, but about Jerry Krause versus Jordan versus the Bulls versus – Phil Jackson, do you think they're telling the story uh, fairly? Yeah, I think everybody's telling the story fairly. Uh, I I would like to hear a little more um, from from Phil. I think because he's got a he's got a uh, a unique take on everything, but I don't think he wants to throw people under the bus. But I mean, we've seen him a couple of times. He's been he's been kind of forthcoming with stuff, but I'd like to see some more from from Phil Jackson especially and we're going to see some more because they're going to obviously highlight the last season that he coached there and I'm sure they're going to go back to him again so uh I'll look forward to that yeah Phil's been excellent man and the word forthcoming has been awesome like it's been revealing what we learned about the Pistons Jerry Krause Jordan uh how much Mm -hmm. he needed a break the image like uh from Space Jam where uh, Jordan's a slave on Monster Mountain. It's like it almost like that came to life when he's sitting in the hotel room from the last dance where he has the black uh, tank top, the white pants, wine all over the place. He looks like he was just kind of human. Like he looks like he was fed up with just the the attention. Yeah, you saw when he was laying on the couch there with the yeah. cigar and then, yep. he, and then he went out into public. I mean, anywhere he went for that, period of time I mean he was mobbed anywhere when he walked into a hotel when he walked into a restaurant when he walked into his barber shop when he walked into the arena when he walked out of the arena when he you know when he got in his limo I mean it was it was anywhere and everywhere he was a rock star and um yeah just like the, just like the way LeBron is I mean the, the only way I can compare but the only thing I can compare it with my own two eyes is when I was down in Atlanta and I covered the Hawks for a couple of years LeBron came down there and when he came down, the locker room, the demeanor and the tenor of the locker room completely changed when his team came to town. It was it was totally different. Like the yeah. vibe, the amount of media. I mean, there was even usually for a Hawks game, there was anywhere from five to ten media members. We had 40 to 50 crammed in this little visitor's locker room around a shirtless LeBron sitting on a stool holding tape recorders in his face trying to get uh, comments. And this is when the Hawks – were playing unbelievable basketball. If you remember, I believe they won almost 60. I think they won, they may have won 60 games, but they had won like 15 or 20 in a row at one point. They were the one seed. They ended up losing to Cleveland in the conference finals that year. But, and then Cleveland went on uh, to play the Warriors. But uh, it, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see how much of, how, how worshipped uh, Jordan was everywhere from China all the way to Chicago. Do you blame Jordan for not being as political as, say, a LeBron? No, because he didn't know the guy. So I understand. And listen, this is a personal preference for everybody. But if I don't know somebody personally, I'm not going to come out and endorse that person. Um, I may donate money to his causes. But I don't want to go on the record and stand up with this guy at a podium and then find out six months later right. that he got in, involved in some sort of scandal. Who know, whatever it may be, whether it, whether it be involving people or property, it doesn't matter. So I respect him in that aspect. On the other hand, uh, the guy that, that he was running against was a racist I mean, his entire life, I mean, he was talking about, you know, segregated schools should be a choice and I mean, some really bad stuff. And so I understand in that aspect that it's like a no brainer that he really should have come out and said something, but I don't think he wanted to get involved and start 
another civil war because his words matter. When LeBron said that stuff about China, that blew up. Yes, I mean, blew dude, up. and he worried about his finances, and everybody jumped of on LeBron course. not to take a stance. Of course. Basically, he was saying, you know, let China handle their own stuff. Uh, what? Communism <laughs> is okay? Okay. No, no, no. For real. That's fine. Uh, no, LeBron, if you want to feel that way, that's cool. Just don't broadcast it, you know, yeah. to the entire world when you're looked up. You know, you didn't see, uh, you know, Tiger or, you know, uh, you know, rest of soul Kobe, you know, come out and, and say something like that. I mean, you know. Uh, the um, the general manager of the Houston Rockets came out and yep. like supported supported Hong Kong, and that was a huge deal. Yep. We think in a country of 360 million people that it's a big deal. Go over to China, where there's and Asia, where there's billions of people, and the NBA is now a global sport. And tech, th th this isn't th th where you call somebody on the phone and file a news report. You know, he tweets that, and all of a sudden it blows up. So, uh, I get, again, t t back to Jordan, I think he was right to keep his nose out of it, uh, even if it was for the wrong reasons. My final question, Robbie, again, thank you for the time and the insight, man. And you're outside of your comedy and your charming personality. You are very uh, intelligent and a very – intuitive individual like i'm trying to use all the i words for you um but my final thing man before this momentum and jordan i like what he said he goes i mean i don't actually he didn't say this but he never screwed up you know he's more of a role model than most people all, all his thing is is just gambling and people are trying to like point out the gambling he goes uh nobody's not eating in my family, every house or car, things paid for. He's, he's like, I'm gambling basically with extra money or uh, stuff that's not going to affect my life. So I understand it. It's still an issue gambling in this country, but it's not the worst thing in the world. And I like how they're telling the story about his past and some uh, some wrinkles in his past. And actually on first take, uh, Stephen A. Smith did a great job he was calling out Jordan for not telling the full story. He was saying that Jordan supported a politician named Bill Bradley down there. And uh, that was not represented on the last dance correctly. And Stephen A. Smith was actually calling out Jordan for that. I haven't looked up Bill Bradley in the Jordan story, but maybe there's more to what the, uh, maybe there's more out there than what the last dance is broadcasting. But my final thing, man, it doesn't seem like Jordan has really bad warts or wrinkles to his past and he's being very open and transparent and winning over a whole nother generation of sports fan and maybe casual fan and life fan because Jordan is that big. He transcends life. And I want to ask you, man, if at the final episode, the last five minutes, you're just going to see him at the podium or maybe just something that's pre-recorded, pre-taped, and he goes, I'm announcing my candidacy for 2024. Feel me on this, man. He's a businessman. He's an athlete. He's probably the greatest athlete we've ever seen in sports history. He's well-spoken. He's smart. He's uh, an amazing executive. He's pretty humble because he doesn't need to make so many public uh, appearances. But in my opinion, do you think if he ran for president, be honest, in 2024, do you think he would win? Think about who is our current president. Do you think Michael Jordan would win in 2024? No, I don't. And I don't think he has any interest in running for office. I think you have a better chance of a guy like Mark Cuban running for president than Michael Jordan. Who would win, Mark Cuban or Michael Jordan? If they both ran for president? Yes. Uh, I think Mark Cuban would. I mean, the guy basically, you know. He's got a sketchier past billion. than Jordan. He's also uh, a more – a more experienced debater and I'd say a more really aggressive knows. person. He's too. on the news all the time. He knows what's going on. If you've seen an interview, you know, he knows foreign policy. He knows domestic policy. So you he want to see more of Jordan. You're saying you don't, you can't make that. You can't put your eggs in that basket yet. You need, you would have to hear him talk more on topics. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's the case. I mean, okay. I don't think either one of them. I mean, I don't think either one of them has a chance. You I, think if like, he tried, Michael Jordan could be a good politician? 
I, I guess so. I don't think he has any interest in politics. I, I don't know why you. I don't think you would Donald think that. Trump did until he was just bored and nothing else to do, man. It's like you get tired of your toys. And Donald Trump, he's 70. He's at the twilight of his life. And he goes, what the F? I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, but then again, this is Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player who ever lived. If he starts going into politics and it fails miserably, he's always going to have that stain. Oh, yeah, but look how he ran for governor. Look how he ran for senator. What a disaster. Or, you know, it's not good. But and what? I don't think he wants to get involved in that world either. He's What's got more money him? than Just... you and I could make in 10 lifetimes. And I don't, I don't see it at all. What's next for him, though? The senior PGA Tour? Like, dude, I don't know what challenges him. Like, look at how competitive he was, man. Like, you're telling me that died, it. that went away? He's just comfortable making shoes every year, every year, every year? Playing, I, mean, he's got his ki- I, mean, he's got, I mean, he's got his kids. I mean, he was involved with the, the Hornets for a while. I, I mean, I, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, I, I don't know his future plans. Maybe somebody will sit down with him, but he's very, you know, this documentary that came out was a big deal because of the fact that he doesn't let a lot of these things, right, right. you know, leak out. Um, not leak out. That's the wrong adjective for it. But he, he he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't let a lot of these compilations be made basically uh, with this much access. And because this footage had been sit on for twenty five years, I mean the it was it's like unearthing a time capsule. It was it's awesome. Uh, I remember when I was in elementary school. Who the heck knows what happened to the letter I wrote to myself when I was in third grade? They said that they were going to mail it mail it to me. It's probably at some old woman's uh, apartment that that we used to live at when I was when I was in elementary school. That they probably sent it to me, but they said they were going to put it in a time capsule and send it in the year two thousand, and that was in I don't know nineteen ninety. That was ten years later, so I never got it, and um, uh, it's maybe it's floating somewhere in uh, in a bottle in the ocean. But I can uh, see you going back in time like the Terminator and snapping elementary school Robbie Rosenhaus. <laughs> <laughs> but dude god, god bless jordan if he's content with uh everything you laid out which he has going on right now then god bless him because some people are like that some people can just be comfortable in their own skin you know i just i feel like i maybe i don't believe that he doesn't have that fire that crazy competitive fire anymore maybe i, I just don't believe that if he can control it I, maybe he can i mean look at eddie murphy man he made the shrek movies and he disappeared for a while He's also at that age where I think he's comfortable after pushing himself, just like Kobe was settling into a new life where That's he was going to start a movie a movie company, and he had his and he had his his daughters, and they were going to start you know Kobe playing won basketball. An Oscar. I, yeah, so I, I I think Jordan's at that point where he's got kids. He can play golf. He can gamble whenever he wants. He can fly in and out of Vegas whenever he wants. He can go play Pinehurst in North Carolina whenever he wants. So. He can go play Augusta whenever he wants. I mean, he's got it all. I don't think he wants to throw it all away in terms of politics. We talked earlier in this interview about my employer, Bloomberg, and how he just went and, you know, lit $500 million on fire. I mean, you know, money to these people is, isn't an object. You know, $10 to, uh, to us is, you know, $1,000 to them. So, I got you. Uh, I think that in the long run, Jordan's comfortable with where he's at in life. And uh, I think that'll come through uh, in a, maybe the last episode or maybe some interviews that he'll do post-documentary. That's what I'm hoping for is that he'll sit down with a Stephen A. Smith or a Scott Van Pelt or even a Bob Costas or you know somebody to sit down and just kind of give that eight to ten minute you know, sit down synopsis, even if it's, you know, on a news program, it could be on Good Morning America, it could be on 60 Minutes, it could be wherever, you know, just give me eight to 10 minutes of somebody sitting down with Michael yeah. and just kind of asking him just to go through, ask about, it Needs to know, be like 45 minutes. They need to do like No, a, no, no, I don't think it does. I don't think it does. And I don't think he, I don't think he would do that either. I think they've, they've done the 10, the, the 10 hour documentary. I think there's certain things you can hit in a, you know, in a 10 minute interview 
on a news program where you can where you can ask them about Isaiah, you can ask them about Phil, you can ask them about Jerry Krause, you can ask them about the cocaine circus. I mean, you know, you know, as a fun aside, not, well, not, I mean, a quote unquote fun aside for some of us, uh, but. It, uh, not that I use cocaine, but it, 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 that was an entertaining joke. But um, I think <laughs> I think you can hit on all the important things, all the vital things that they kind of crush. And, and listen, we still got four more episodes to go, so there's still some more stuff, including a practice fight with Steve Kerr this week. So I think um, Shh, I'm tired of hearing that freaking really that tease of a story with the Kerr and Jordan story. But uh, Robbie, you know, you did say interview. You said, "Oh, I came on earlier in this interview." You just said. Uh, I don't know, man. I, a couple of more of these. Uh, I would you be comfortable like being a uh, maybe a co-host on the Iktagon? I, I I really don't. I hate that it would be like the Ike and Rob show, and you wow. would have to sit under the umbrella of the uh, Iktagon. But I I thoroughly enjoyed this uh, this conversation, man. Well, no, it was good. I I enjoyed it as well, and uh, gives me an excuse to talk to you every week. Sure, you sure you don't want to? You sure you don't want to uh, look up any dead co-hosts? You know that you want to put on the air. <laughs> we got Imus coming on next. Oh my god! Maybe, maybe Kimbo Slice. You know, get Aww. the UFC stuff. It's really no. May oh. he rest in peace. He's one. Of, listen, Kimbo's Kimbo's my guy. I love Kimbo. So you know. Uh, well, I, last I, thing, man. Who would do? Who would do that interview? Great. I think uh, Jordan to get the the shakedown, the the really great answers. I think it would have to be Mike Greenberg or Stephen A. Smith. I wouldn't put Greenberg in there. Uh, Stephen A would be Ooh, good. No respect. He can do something with TNT with Ernie Johnson. That would be good. Ernie Johnson. Hey, Michael, the cocaine circus. Or, or David Aldridge, who covered those teams. Or David Aldridge, the one. That's the cleaned up one. You haven't heard. That was number two. My first choice, and I'll leave you on this, and, and you're going to be like, that's the guy who should do it. Ike Mike Wilbon. Wilbon. Ike Wilbon? Mike Wilbon. Not Ike Wilbon. <laughs> some, some, some Jewish mulatto guy in Sayville? No, not, not <laughs> Ike Wilbon. Oh, my Wilbon. gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Mike Wilbon. He'd be a good one. He covered the team. He's from Chicago, so he'd be a good one too. So I don't it should know be fun. if Mike and Tony have been like in this atmosphere in terms of attention span for the last ten years. Yeah, Tony. Uh, Dude, Tony's 20, got 2005, to 2010, That stretch of uh, part in the interruption was great. I think they looked tired. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, Tony's getting a little long, in the, uh, long in the tooth. Dude, as soon as he said the Hannah Storm comment, shh. That is, yeah, it wasn't a good situation. But uh, Hannah Storm uh -huh. made an appearance on the uh, the last dance. Yeah, she did. Her father just passed away, actually. No, I, I can't believe we're ending on this note. But uh, yeah, Andrea Kramer, she's excellent way back when, and even now, she's still excellent. Yeah, she's good, too. She's I'll, on, uh, on I'll get NBC into a story uh, uh, to bring this back to where we met. I'll get into a story about Andrea Kramer and Amy Lawrence maybe next week. <laughs> but <laughs> Perfect. The, the former boss of mine slash host that I produced a overnight show for, but maybe we'll get into that next week. <laughs> That's the tease. <laughs> Let's just say Fair she's enough. a 45-year-old single woman with no kids that has a drive – of a Bulls bench player, which is not a bad thing. Like Amy Lawrence could be the the Paxton or the Steve Kerr of radio, which is not a bad thing. No, that's no, that's fair. And she's on the who's team. she's on the team? And who's Darwin Zook? Tony Kukoc? <laughs> I'm Darwin Zook. <laughs> Tony Kukoc. No, he's Bill Lambeer. <laughs> He wishes That's he could bad. knock out everybody. And they're like, dude, That's he gets stepped on just because of his pecs. But he's actually That's an intelligent, cool guy. He's as nice as they come. I'm Darwin Zook. <laughs> who would, who would uh, Peter Schwartz be? <laughs> Jerry Krause. <laughs> Don't give him that much credit. <laughs> no, nah, you can put together a team. He knows. Francesa he knows is Michael Jordan, obviously, right? Yes. 
Scotty Pippen of WFAN and CBS Sports Radio Network. Scotty Pippen, Scotty Pippen. Uh, Jim Rome, maybe? No. No, no, no. Damon Amendolara? No, 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 no. Maybe Damon Amendolara, Steve Kerr. He was under Francesa. He studied under Francesa. Now he went on to coach and win a championship. I guess I, I honestly, I'm, I'm, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't brush up on my, uh, you know, CBS Sports and WFN comparisons to 1990 Chicago Bulls. <laughs> we got to do that tomorrow. Given, I mean, if I would have been given some time to prepare, maybe I would have been able to come up with some app comparisons. But that, Zach Gallup is Jalen Rose. I got nothing for you. Just like if you asked me to break down a kicker or a punter in the NFL draft, I got nothing. Oh my gosh. Oh dude, we got to get to your thoughts. Did you see, was the Mike Vrabel thing? Did you see that where somebody was taking a shit in the background? Was that real? I, I think that was a fake toilet. Oh yes. I think it was fake. Sorry to spoil everybody's uh, fun. I love I Mike Vrabel just for that. He gives the stoic look. He's the only one wearing like a button up collared shirt. And then he's got some fucking Smurf dude in the background. He's got some other character to his other shoulder. Somebody taking a shit. And he's just stoic staring at his computer. Like uh, Mike Vrabel uh, won me over for that. Not only just because of his great coaching year this past year, but he seems like he's, he's a character. Yeah, he is. That was a lot of fun. He definitely is. For Dude, the sure. Jets need, are you a Jets or a Giants? No, no, you're no. a Vikings fan. You're a Vikings fan. You guys had a good year. Yeah, they won a playoff game, and, and now we'll see what happens uh, this year. The schedule came out yesterday, so uh, you have we'll, the new, we'll hopefully uh, don't play. Oh, the, the schedule did come out. Oh, my gosh. We got to go to Vegas for a game. I've been waiting for the schedule to come out to see when the Jets are playing. NFL schedule Raiders. Do you got to go anywhere? They, the Jets play uh, uh, the Raiders at home, man. This year. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. But w- would you go to Vegas with me? Because, dude, I got a kid coming in December, so I'm trying to get some trips in. <laughs> what about <laughs> Chiefs Raiders 11-22? Or Chiefs. Uh, or uh, Broncos Raiders. We could get Anthony Gallo to join us in Vegas. Nobody on this podcast knows or cares about Anthony Gallo. You think they know or care about Amy Lawrence? Less. <laughs> I'm kidding, Amy. I'm kidding, Amy. I busted my ass for you for four plus years. Give me a break. Um, yeah. I mean, w- would you be down? Oh my gosh, Bucks Raiders ten twenty five, dude. Vegas on Halloween weekend. Sounds good. Yeah. You sound like half-hearted, bro. When have I ever had to like break your arm to go to Vegas? No, I think I think it's a great idea. Maybe uh, Saints Raiders in September. When would be October would be warm still in Vegas. Yeah, it'll be warm in October still. It's an outdoor stadium, right? Yeah, no, it's a it's it's a covered it's a covered stadium. There's no opening a, at all. No, there's no opening whatsoever. They, they screwed that. that up. That, that's a big screw up. Um. Because yeah, Adesanya wants to fight John Jones in the summer of 2021 in the Raiders Stadium. How cool would it have been if they had a blimp? Uh, how many seats is the stadium? 60-something thousand, I think. How cool would it be to have like a, a blimp shot like going over the, the stadium uh, for John Jones' Israel Adesanya? Be It'd like be amazing. Thrilla in Manila. Yeah, it'll be amazing in that new yeah. stadium. Yeah, it'll be great. Now they have another place to stage fights uh, in Vegas. Unfortunately, we have to wait till Adesanya beats Jones for the UFC to have the new coming of Connor. So, yep. If that happens, then he'll be on ESPN, which is sad. He should be now. But Robbie, anything uh, to close with, brother? No, thanks for having me on. I mean, I. Uh... I'm I'm really looking forward to the fights this weekend, and um, let's get you I'm on next forward. week, all right, brother? Yeah, sure, absolutely. All right, Robbie, thank you very much for the time, folks. Uh, my next guest is running late. We're gonna connect with him in just a moment, and we'll get back with more UFC 249 preview. Thank you, Robbie.